Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot. I'm the program manager for Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today and our friends at La Clinica de la Raza for hosting today's session on patient-centered communication skills, the four habits model. This is part one of two parts with Dr. Scott Abramson. Dr. Abramson retired from Northern California Kaiser Permanente after practicing neurology staff for over 40 years. For over 25 years, Dr. Abramson has been passionately involved in the communication and physician wellness project projects at Kaiser Permanente. He has written and developed programs on time management and communication. And most recently, Dr. Abramson authored a book entitled Bedside Manner for Physicians and Everybody Else, What They Don't Teach You in Medical School or Any Other School. Dr. Abramson has been a longtime volunteer at the Samaritan House Medical Clinic in San Mateo, San Mateo, California, helping provide medical care for the indigenous of that county. He's also been a longtime volunteer at the USO, helping provide rest and respite to the young men and women in our armed forces. And we are extra lucky to have him as one of our Maven Project volunteers. So Dr. Abramson, when you're ready, please begin. Okay. Well, thank you, Kristen. appreciate that. Um, and uh, well, I know this is La Raza Clinica, and you guys are in Oakland, California, and I practice neurology right in San Leandro, so I was right right next right next door to you folks. Um, and this is all the stuff that you need to. And um, so, if you're in Oakland, you probably have been to Fenton's Creamery, and uh, it's still there, uh, as you know. And and I, I the reason I put that up is because. My, the first time I ever came to Oakland, California, I was 18 years old and I took a bus here and I had a cousin that lived out here. And the first place we went was Fenton's Creamery. And I always remember that. It was, um, the, the, the portions were huge and, and the ice cream what, for an 18 year old was delicious. So anyway, um, we're gonna talk about community uh, communication. And, and um, I really like this, I like this quote. The biggest problem with communication is the illusion that it has taken place. Because if if you were to, and I've seen this so many times, if you have an interaction between a nurse, practitioner, a, a clinician of some sort, and a patient, and you ask afterwards, you ask the clinician, you say, how did things go? And the clinician is going to say, man, it, it was really good. You know, I, I, I got a good history. I did a good exam. I diagnosed the problem. I gave the right treatment. Man, I feel so good about that. And then if you were to interview the patient, so many times they're gonna say, I don't know what, I don't know what that guy was talking about. I, it, it's, I don't know. Um, and so that's the thing. I think that's the, that's the disconnect that we have. But so let me ask you this. Suppose you have two clinicians and both of them uh, get the same history they do the same exam. They come to the same conclusion about the diagnosis. They give the same treatment. But one of these doctors has a little bit better, has better bedside manner, let's say. So what difference does it make? What difference does it make? I mean, they give the same treatment. They come to the same conclusion. Why? What difference? So I want you to just think about that for about 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and then after you've thought about it, chat the first chat the first answer to Kristen that, that comes to your mind. Let me give you. you know, both, both make the same diagnosis, give the same treatment. So what difference does it make? Kristen, do you do you have any any answers come through? I can't see the chats. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. It's a. Oh, the patient follows the advice. The patient follows the advice. Exactly. Exactly. If you're connected, so so. One of these. We have another one. Things, I'm sorry. What else, Kristen? Happier patient or patient feels heard? Yeah, patient feels heard. Patient, and then if a patient feels heard, if they if they like the doctor, if they connect with the doctor, 
they're going to be more likely to follow his advice or her advice or the, or the you know, when I say doctor, I'm going to use the word doctor here, but I, you know, I mean, clinician, I, I know. So, in, so if I, but, but if they connect with somebody they're they're going to be more likely to follow the advice. So better. And if they follow your advice, you know, hopefully that's going to lead to a better outcome. Hopefully you're going to give good advice. And, you know, when I, I as Kristen said, for the last 25 years of my career, I was really involved in the communication mission at Kaiser. And one, and this fact hit me with, you know, I had this epiphany about this. And here's what happened. I am seeing this very sweet little old lady. She's coming back for a return of visit. And I had sent her to a surgeon. It was a minor problem, but I'd sent her to the surgeon. So she's coming back for a recheck to see me. And I'm looking at my schedule and I'm kind of running behind. I look at this guy, see she's on and say, oh, this is going to be really, this is going to be easy. You know, she's going to come in. She's going to say, Dr. Abramson, I had this surgery. I feel so good. Thank you so much. And, you know, if I was lucky, she'd bring me some little old lady brownies or something. So she comes in and she, and she says to me, Dr. Abramson, I would not let that surgeon touch me with a 10 foot laser beam. And then what she said next really just, this, this is what got me. And so picture this, you know, a nice little old lady in a bonnet, she had white gloves, you know, and she says, that surgeon you sent me to, Dr. Abramson, these were her exact words, her words, not mine, was one pompous little prick. And you know, the funny thing is, you know, I know this surgeon, he is an excellent surgeon. He's got great hands and nurses have told me he's great in the operating room. But the fact is, you know, personality wise, you know, he is kind of what, you know, this lady said he was. And the point is, is that if if we can't connect with people, if if we can't build that trust, whatever we offer them, whether it's surgery or whether it's blood pressure medicine or a recommendation to get a colonoscopy or whatever, they're, they're not going to do it unless they connect with us and trust us. So that is, that, that's the deal. You had it right that, that the patients are more likely to follow our advice. Now, I wonder if any of you thought of this, that the value of clinician outcome when we connect with people, when we have better bedside manner. And I can tell you this was, this was true with myself because the first 20 years, I was at Kaiser for 40 years. So the first 20 years, I was like the traditional, you know, diagnose, find it, fix it, doctor. He, you know, your, here's your symptoms. I've done the exam. Here's the medicine for you. I got, here's the diagnosis. That's how, and, and I was competent at it. But I can tell you this, if I hadn't have taken this communication course, um, I would have retired a lot sooner than, than I did. Because when I started doing the skills that we're going to talk about today, it brought so much meaning and joy into my practice. And it's not just because when you connect with someone, if you have better bedside manner and you connect with somebody, they're going to follow your advice. They're going to have better outcomes. That's one thing. But it's also, you know, that feeling that, man, I connected with someone in a human way. And, and that is, you, you can't put a value on that really. So we're going to talk about, this is the Kaiser model, and we use it here at Maven. It's the four habit model. Habit one, invest in the beginning. Habit two, get patient perspectives. Number three, express empathy. Number four, invest in the end. We're going to do the first two habits today and the next two in our next session when we meet. And I mean, if you look at any paradigms of communication, a lot of them have this same kind of thing, but I just, I like the Kaiser the way we do it. But Okay, so let's talk about habit one, invest in the beginning. And we're going to talk about four things here. We're going to talk about just the, stat, the basics about establishing rapport. We're talking about, we're going to talk about investing in your exam room and your homepage. And we're talking about planning the visit and investing in your staff. So those are the four aspects of habit number one. So I'd like you to do this. Think about what you might do to invest in the beginning. In other words, in those first few minutes, when a patient comes in, how do you establish rapport? How do you build trust? How do you build connection? And I'm going to give you some time to think about this. Don't You don't need to chat anything, but just write down as many things as you can, like in the next 30 seconds.
what do you normally do to build trust? Connection. And just write down as many things as you can. So, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to, so this, so these are what people have come up with in the past. So I'm just going to list some things that people have come up with. Now, if, if, if you have something that's not on the list, I'd really like you to let us know because we can add to, we are adding to our list all the time. So smile. A lot of us, <laughs> you know, forget about that. Shake hands, sit down, sit down. People, you know, it's, it really makes a difference when you're sitting and eye to eye with someone as, as opposed to standing over them. Introduce yourself and your role, how they would like to be addressed, acknowledge family members, apologize. You know, I um, when my son was in uh, preschool, they had a new, we had a new principal. He'd come from another part of the country. He had signed up for Kaiser and he knew I was a Kaiser doctor. And uh, the first time I came into the office to uh, pick up my son, he, he says, you know, he says, I went to your Kaiser and uh, I had a, 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 and I waited 45 minutes to see the doctor. And he says, you know, but that's OK. He says, I understand that, you know, emergencies happen. But the guy didn't even have the decency to apologize. He says, you know, my time is important, too. So I explain the use of the computer and manage. I have a colleague who will. You know, we always complain, oh, the computer gets in the way of stuff. You know, it makes it, it's a barrier between us and our patients. But this, this colleague of mine, he, he's managed to actually manage up the computer. He'll, he sits in front of the computer. The patient is right on the, and he looks at the patient. He says, now look, he says, I got this, we got this great tool here and I can do anything with it. I can pull up your x-rays. I can pull up all your lab tests. Just press a button. It's so great. And, you know, and he says, and while we are conversing, you know, I may be using the computer from time to time, but, uh, um, but I hope you'll understand. Then, of course, if the patient has something really crucial to say, to reveal or something like that, he'll stop looking at the computer, look directly at the patient and, and carry on the conversation. Um, make a social statement and show that you're familiar with the patient's medical history. So these are some of the basic things um is is there does is there anything that anybody had thought about that we don't have on this list and you can chat it to to Kristen I don't see anything yet no chats okay so yeah if you think of anything later on let us know because we're always trying to add to this list but here's something I bet I bet no one thought about this or just a few of you thank the ride giver Right, because a lot of times our patients come in with a ride giver. Sometimes it's a neighbor or a friend or whatever. And to me, I'll tell you, these are the true heroes of America, because you know they will bring their neighbor to the clinic. They'll sit with them, wait till the doctor comes. They'll go sit with them, wait for the blood test, wait for the X-ray, wait for the prescription. I mean, they spent a half a day in the clinic with their with their neighbor or with their friend. I mean. And so if, if I see the, if someone is a ride giver and they're with the patient, I will, I will definitely, I'll, I'll, I'll compliment on, on, on their activity. I, the, the, and I'll tell them they're a real hero. And a lot of times the thing is the, the person that gives the ride may be the decision maker. So the conversation may go like this, uh, you know, I've just seen my patient Ethel in the in the clinic, and I've ordered some tests for her, and they're walking out. And Ethel says to her friend Velma, she says, uh, "I don't know, Velma. I don't know about this guy Abramson. I don't know if I'm going to get this test. He seemed like a kind of a weird guy." And Velma, who I just complimented for being a hero ride giver, is going to say, "Oh no, 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 Ethel. This guy's this this Abramson guy is really really worth listening to." So. Here's what, so I'm just going to elaborate a little bit on this and show you what this, and show, try to show you what the value of this can be. Real quick, Dr. Yeah. Abramson, there was a oh. comment in the chat that said they yes. would talk to the child before the parents. Oh, you mean, oh, oh, if in, in a pediatric visit? Yeah, I guess. You know, I guess I, 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 I see, I'm not a pediatrician. I don't see pediatrics, but I guess it could go either way, depending on the age of the child you know i mean uh, obviously you know you're not going to get much information from a two-year-old but 
I'm not, I, I don't know about that, honestly. I, I, um, I think a lot when they're a little bit older, maybe just they're afraid to yeah. talk in, in front of their parents. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. and there's all those issues about, you know, uh, you know, like, I, I don't I, with teenagers, you know, I mean, 13 or 14, do they get to talk to the doctor alone and confidentially and so forth? I think all those issues come up. But, let, but so let's try this. Here's the, the power. Of, I'd like to try to show you the power of a social statement. So uh, good morning, Esther. Glad you could come in. Tell me about Luis's first birthday party. Oh, it's so nice. Nurse Patty, the whole family was there. That little boy is so smart. You know, of course. All these, I don't know why it is. All these, all these little kids these days are so smart. I never hear a grandparent say, you know, he's, he's about average, you know, a little of this, a little of that. Anyway. Oh, he's so cute. Look at those big brown eyes. You must be such a proud grandma. And then she returns to the medical visit and takes care of stuff. Now, later on, you know, she does what she does. What she does. And later, Esther goes to the senior citizen bingo. And here's the snippet of their conversation. I am the nicest nurse practitioner. Nurse Patty is so sweet. You know how I love to eat when Nurse Patty talked to me about my diet. And I just ordered that low-fat cookbook she said would help. You know, Dr. X was my doctor for years, and he was always getting on my case about losing weight. I'm sure he's a smart doctor, and he had all those diplomas, but I really like Nurse Patty. Now, which clinician, Nurse Patty or the brilliant Dr. X, was more likely to change Esther's dietary habits? And I mean, the, the and obviously it's a rhetorical question because of course, Nurse Patty connected with her. She likes Nurse Patty. She trusts her. So it doesn't matter how brilliant you are. If you don't connect with people, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, okay, so this is another one of those things, making a familiar uh, with medical history statement. And sometimes we sometimes we fall into this trap and we do this. So this is the first scenario, right? Scenario one. So Mr. Doe visits the doctor and, and, and the doctor, like all of us, review the medical conditions, reviews the chart, and uh, he knows about condition X and condition Y, uh, but he doesn't really take the time, he doesn't mention it. And he goes, so Mr. Doe, what's going on today? How can I help you? Well, I had this disease X for the last six months. First one doc told me I didn't have it, then said it was stressed, and I saw this specialist, really sharp, nice fellow. He did all, what do you call it, high blood, blah, 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 blah. Okay, uh, and did you know I also got this Y deal? You know, I can't figure out how I caught it. No one in my family ever had anything like that. Of course, I'm not sure about Uncle Wayne's, but uh, you know, this I kind of kept it. I just can't figure it out. Blah blah blah. But anyway, Doc, I'm here hoping you can help me with this new thing here I'm having with my problem Z. Here's what's happening. Okay, so that's scenario one. Now scenario two, same thing. Visits a doctor. Doctor Smith is aware of conditions X and Y in the medical record, but he takes a few seconds to acknowledge that. So, Mr. Doe, I've made myself familiar with your medical history. I realize you have condition X and Y, but what's going on today? Oh, okay. Well, uh, I got this new thing here. Problem with uh, Z. So, simple thing. Two scenarios. In one, the clinician expressed familiarity with the patient history. In the other, they did not. It took him two seconds. You know, questions to ponder. You know, which one and which approach is Mr. Doe likely to feel more confident in his doctor's knowledge? And I don't know, but I don't know about in your situation in La Raza, but at Kaiser, we would have these uh, patient surveys. And one of the questions on the, per, on, the, on, the, on the survey was, was the doctor or clinician familiar, familiar with your history? Well, in, in, in this case, Mr. Doe's probably going to say, yeah, the doc, the, in the second scenario, he sure was. He knew about the, uh, X and Y. And which approach saves close in time? See, a lot of people say, oh, you know, you do this uh, communication stuff. It just takes a lot of time. But this one little skill has, has saved you two or three minutes right there because you acknowledge that you know X and Y. Okay. So now we're going to go to, we've talked about some of the establishing rapport. And now we're going to talk about planning the visit. And this is all part of the, you know, uh, habit one. Um, and let's talk about this. 
So let's see what happened. This is about the patient with the list and how you can plan that visit most optimally. So listen to this dialogue. Dr. Ernest, I know how busy you are and I've made a list for you. I've been concentrating on my health like you told me to at the last visit. I just want to make your job a little easier. That's great, Ms. Listed. So what's troubling you? Well, number one, there's the insomnia. I just can't seem to get a good night's sleep. Do you think I need more fiber in my diet? George says I do. Insomnia, got it. Fiber in diet. And um, number two on my list, the dizziness. Oh, it just seems to come and go. Is this what they call vertigo, doctor? Dizziness, okay. And number three, oh, I've been having... And number 17, doctor. Well, I don't want to sound like a hypochondriac, but you know that tingling? Hang on, Ms. Listed. Could you repeat number 15? I think I missed that one. Okay, so let's ask this. How did Dr. Ernest make things difficult for herself? Think about that, and, and, and you might want to chat what you think to Kristen. Any uh, any chat answers, Kristen? Yeah. How did Dr. Ernest in this scenario make things difficult for herself? Okay, uh, very open-ended, didn't set any expectations. Didn't set any expectations. And certainly she didn't set any boundaries or expectations that there would be any boundaries around this list. We also have didn't ask direct questions regarding reason for the visit. And she should ask direct questions rather than listening to all the complaints. She listened, she, she listened to all the complaints and boy, boy, at numbers and she missed number 15 and that, you know, who knows. So how could she have done things better? Well, let's let me give you this suggestion about how Dr. Real? Ernest. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Yep. So we have asked patients to prioritize the complaints and prioritize then also the mm -hmm. um, at introduction state the reason for visit. And introduction state the state the reason. Of course, she had a of course this patient, Ms. Listed, had a whole bunch of things. I don't know, it wasn't clear that she prioritized anything, but that would be a great question to ask. Right, what's the most important thing for you? Um, so let, here's the suggestion we have about planning the visit. And you see a lot of patients coming in with a list. Sometimes it's on paper, sometimes it's on their cell phone, whatever. So this is, uh, the main thing is the list can be your friend, You but you have to take control of the list. You cannot let this list it hold on to the list because otherwise, She's going to go on forever. You've got to set boundaries, set expectations. So here's our advice about how to handle the patient with the list. And we call it the TKO. You know, TKO in boxing means you knock someone or you they can't fight any further. You don't necessarily knock them out. But here's what we mean. So you've got to TKO the list. So the first thing is, you take the list. You have got to get it in your hands. You can't let her be reading it. So um, the second thing is you give, once you have it in your hands, then you give a knowing nod. So you're looking at this list. It's got 25 things on it. And you don't have to mention everything. You just have to look at it and give a knowing nod like, mm -hmm, I understand this. I got this. Or... And finally, you optimize, as someone, one of you said, the optimizer list, which is the most important thing to, to manage. So if I was doing this, so Kristen, if you could help me out here, let's say 
So you come in with the list and and I'm and you've got you're sitting in the exam chair. I'm I'm with you and I'm I see you got this big list. So I'm going to go, oh, uh, Kristen, uh, wow, I see you brought in this list. Thank you so much for doing that. This makes my job uh, a lot easier. Uh, I can see you've worked really hard on this. Uh, may I take the list, please, as you actually take it, you know, and? Sure. <laughs> okay. Well, th and okay. Well, Kristen, I'm looking at all these uh, complaints. Uh-huh. Yes. I see this one. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. That one. Mm-hmm. Number 14, got it. Number 16, got that one. Number seven, got that one. So so I've spent like about five seconds with the knowing nod. And Kristen, uh, does that give you the impression that I'm familiar with what you yes. brought into me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we rehearsed this, you know, so. Uh, I'm on TV, should I promise? <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, so then we optimize the list. This is a TKO. So, uh, so Kristen, let me ask you, you know, uh, I tell you, as I look at your list, uh, the thing that I think that is most important that we talk about today is that chest pain that you've been having. Does that sit well with you? Well, yes, I think that's important, but also I've been having some pain in my knee that I think might be more important. Pain in the knee. Okay. All right. So, okay. So, so we dis we sort of disagree on this, you know, but okay, let's do this. Let's, let's, uh, let's work on both these things. We'll, we'll talk about the chest pain and then we'll, we'll work on the uh, pain in the knee too. Sound okay? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. So that's the thing with the list is you've got to take the list. You've got to get it in your hands. You know, once you have it in your hands, a knowing nod, and then you work with the patient to optimize it. That's, uh, that's, these are a lot of things that see a lot of these communication things, they will save you a lot of time and, and actually can help build trust. So, so here's some other, you know, you thank the patient for making the list, you compliment for being so thorough and you ask permission to take your, take the list as you take it. So that's one way to plan to visit. So that's, that's a, actually, that's the easy one, the patient with the list. What's harder is this one, the oh, by the way, doctor. So let's listen what happens here. Hi, Dr. Diligent. I guess you know Dr. Williams sent me here for dizziness. It's been getting so much worse. Oh, now, are you spinning? Um, or are you lightheaded? Well. Is the room spinning? I don't know. Is it more like a faint? Uh, is it? Dr. Diligent takes his dizzy history, does his dizzy exam, orders his dizzy lab test, requests his dizzy x-rays, prescribes his dizzy medicine, hands out his dizzy health information. Dr. Diligent is just about to shake hands with her in parting when... So call me, Mrs. Jones, next week with an update. It has been a real pleasure and a privilege to... Thank you, Dr. Diligent. You know, Dr. Williams was also wondering about the queasiness in my stomach. Um, do you think you can check that out, too? The queasiness? Uh, okay, sure. Dr. Diligent takes his queasy stomach history, does his queasy stomach exam, orders his queasy stomach lab test, requests his queasy stomach x-rays. Dr. Diligent is just about to shake hands with her in parting when... So call me, Mrs. Jones, next week with an update. I'm real interested to hear how Thank things... you. Thank you, Dr. Diligent. Um, one other thing. Do you think you could take a look at my toes? I think I've picked up a fungus or something. That health club is not the cleanest place. The toes. Hmm. Fungus, huh? Dr. Diligent takes his fungus in the toe history, does his fungus in the toe exam, orders his fungus in the toe lab test, requests his fungus in the toe x-rays. Dr. Diligent is hurriedly actually shaking hands with her this time as he actually is escorting her a bit forcefully out the door. So good to see you, Mrs. Jones. Oh, doctor, Please. one more thing. So guess what the one last thing is going to be? Any thoughts? Chest pain. Chest pain. Oh, yeah. You've been there. <laughs> You've been there. Okay. So, how did Dr. Diligent make things difficult for himself? This happens a lot, you know. You know. Uh, what did he do? 
And let me ask the third question. What question might he ask at the outset that might save time? Any thoughts? Well, uh, it seems like, it seems like, um, you know, what Dr. Diligent did, what so many of us do, we, we, we hear a symptom and boy, we're going to go after it. We're going to, you know, we hear the second symptom. We're going to go after that with our, with our history, with our, you know, whatever workup we want to do with our answers. And then the third, so we do. So uh, let's, so, so let's, let, let, Kristen, let's try to show how this could work better. Okay. Um, so let's say you come in to see me, Kristen, and I say, so, uh, so Kristen, what are you, what are you here to see me for today? Oh, doctor, when I, you know, my eyes start to hurt and then it gives me a massive headache and then I can't read. And then I can't even, I can't even do my work on the computer, but I'm getting these horrible. Okay. Headaches. Well, great. I know I, I, I'm just going to uh, apologize for interrupting Kristen, but, but I just want to make sure I get all the information now. So you, you're here for the eye problem. Mm -hmm. Um, and is there anything? Yes, I um, hope that it not just freeze. Did I freeze? Um, okay, I'm back. Dr. Yeah. Did I freeze? Yeah, I think you did. Yeah. Oh, so sorry. I knew it was going to happen. Sorry about that. But so we yes, got the eye this... problem. Is there anything else, Kristen? Oh, I have the headache and then I have this sore throat. I mean, I know it's yeah. allergy season, but like, you know, it's dripping. And then I have the chest pain because of the sore throat and I can't breathe at night. Sorry, I'm connected to my hotspot. It should not happen again. Okay, so I, I think we got. I, I'm I'm just explaining what the gist of this was. So after each after each symptom, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna wait for for you to for Kristen to give an explanation, or I'm not gonna I'm just gonna say anything else, anything else, and I'm gonna get all those things like like Doctor Diligent didn't do. I'm gonna get them all out on the table, and then I can come back and go back. So here's the. So this is the challenge. When people don't have a list on paper, when it's not on paper, that can be more difficult. So what you have to do is you get the whole story, all the symptoms, and then you scan, you scan the prairie. You scan the, all the symptoms, and then you choose the gopher hole. Then you optimize what all those complaints are. So that's the other aspect of planning the visit. So we've talked about the, the basics. We've talked about planning the visit. Let's talk about investing in the exam room and your home page. So guess who these ladies are talking about? They are talking about you. They're talking about the visit to the clinic, the visit to the nurse practitioner. That, and, they, and, and they're not talking things like, oh, wow, you ought to see my, the way my nurse can feel a spleen. Oh, my God. What, what my PA can do with a steth Gee whiz. It's, no, they're not talking about that. They're, they're saying things like, you know, boy, my, my nurse practitioner has the cutest little twins. Wow. You know, they want to know you as a person. That's what they're talking about. And, and in your exam room, you know, we all have these exam rooms, like really boring stuff, you know, but it doesn't have to be like that. This is a colleague of mine, Dr. John Malone. He was a Navy flight surgeon. And he, on his bulletin board in his exam room, he has pictures of him flying, he has pictures of airplanes. So people come in there, they may wait five or 10 minutes to see him, but they're enjoying themselves. And by the time they get in there, it's like they've already connected with them. They're going to Dr. Malone. Hey, you know, my son was in the Navy. You know, Dr. Malone, I, I like airplanes too. You know, wow, the Blue Angels. So just by exa your exam room, you can connect with people. My wife, um, so my wife, uh, we moved to a different part of the Bay Area from uh, Hayward to uh, uh, 
to San Mateo. And uh, my wife was assigned a new doctor in Redwood City. So she goes to see the doctor. And of course, it's just to get acquainted visit. Nothing wrong with my wife. She comes home and she says, what a wonderful doctor. What a wonderful doctor. And, you know, I'm in the business of communication. So I'm trying to find out what did this doctor do that made him so wonderful? There's nothing wrong with my wife. And she's and I keep asking, her, oh, what a wonderful, wonderful man. Finally, after like about, you know, 15 minutes of interrogation, she says to me, Oh, what a what a what a wonderful doctor, what a lovely wife, what adorable children. And it turns out all he did was have a picture of his of his family in the exam room. That's all. So I tried doing that myself and trying to get my own a picture of a, the adorable family. And um, no, it didn't work out that way. But actually, this is my family, really. These are my two two sons, and and um when they were little, and and the thing is, so, um, and and it's not just I'm, I'm giving a talk here, but this is what this is about. So now I'm not just some old geezer giving you guys a lecture on something. I'm a guy who has these two, at one time had these two cute little sons. You know, it. I'm trying to build rapport and connection. I mean, we don't we don't have the DNA tests finalized yet, but. It's anyway. So, and then every, all of you probably have a home page. So patients can look at this and know a little bit about you before they see you. And a lot of these home pages are like this. You know, I went to blah, blah university and my residency who the, you know, I'm so grateful to be at the healthcare system. Uh, look forward, you know, they're just, just boilerplate stuff and the personal stuff. I love the outdoors. My hobbies are blah, blah, blah. You know, uh, it's just such boilerplate stuff, but one of my colleagues has a homepage and this is what it reads. And I just want to read it to you because I, I just love this homepage. She says, I learned from my father that even the hell of war can result in good. My father and many others moved from North to South Korea during the Korean war. Most of these people lived in poverty and disease in South Korea. However, my father turned the hell and loneliness of war into a positive caring situation. He always volunteered and our family uh, itself and our family. We regularly cook meals, wash laundry, and clean for the people of Korea, especially the elderly. In the end, my father's generosity to others influenced me to become a doctor. Just as my father turned the hell of war into something good, I have tried to make a difference as the doctor my father inspired me to be. So if you're a patient and you pick up this homepage and you read that, but you, you haven't even seen Dr. Cho yet, but all of a sudden, you know, you, you have a connection to her. And you didn't, and Dr. Cho didn't, it didn't take any work on Dr. Cho's part. So we've talked about the basics, establishing rapport, investing in the exam room, planning the visit. Now let's talk about, because this is all investing in the beginning, we're going to talk about investing in your staff. So here's, here's scenario number one. This happens frequently. Registers to see, yeah, you know, I'm supposed to see this Dr. Abramson, his first visit. I've been having these headaches. I'm kind of nervous. I'm just wondering, you know, um, you know, um, just have a seat over there, sir. The doctor will be with you shortly. Okay, that's scenario one. Scenario two. Hello, Josh. Uh, and Josh asks, you know, I'm supposed to see Dr. Abramson and, you know, I'm kind of nervous. And Josh, I've worked with Dr. Abramson a long time. He's a very nice man. You will like him. Or suppose Dr. Abrams is not such a nice man. Well, I've worked with him a long time. He may seem a little serious, but he's very experienced. He will take good care of you. You know, and, and all uh, and all Dr. Abramson has to do is just sort of crack a smile and he's already exceeded expectations. Or suppose he's a new clinician and not very experienced. Well, you, you know, he's one of our new physicians. He's up to date on all the latest. You know, you can always say something nice. And in which scenario will connection be made even before the visit? And we talked about this because if patients connect with you, if they like you, if they trust you, they're going to follow your advice and therefore they're going to have better outcome. So I'm going to ask you all this question. How do you establish the good rapport with your staff? How do you invest in them? Maybe this is something you want to think about, um, that you want to think about um, until we meet next. But I, let me tell you this. Uh, I'll tell you this story. My, my wife took my son. He was only, he was, he, he was just, you know, maybe seven or eight years old. And she took him to the ear doctor. And the ear doctor, you know, it was nothing serious. It was just a minor thing. But I come home that night and I say, how did the appointment go with the ear doctor? 
And my wife says, it went okay, everything went fine. That doctor is tops in his field. Now I'm thinking to myself, because I'm in the communication business, like I said, how did, how did my wife get to know that this guy was tops in his field? He didn't, you know, it was a minor thing. And so I asked, I says, how do you, now, how did you come to the conclusion that, that, that this doctor's tops in his field? And my wife looked at me like I was clueless. And she says, well, the nurse who put Jeremy in the room told me so. The nurse who put Jeremy in the room told me so. So the point is, you know, if you have a connection with your staff like that, all of you, everyone can be tops in their field. Oh, um, why is that there? Oh, yeah, because um, because whenever I give a talk, you know, I run this by my wife and, and, she, and she said, you know, your talk's okay, but, you know, you never smile. So uh, I put in this sort of smile break here. So I'm going to just yeah, smile and... Uh, you know, sort of move on, get that in there. So habit one, we talked about invest in the beginning. We talked about the basics, the personalizing the exam room and the homepage, planning the visit. We talked about the written list, the unwritten list and investing in staff. So habit two is getting patient perspective. And to me, this was, this was the habit that just turned my career around. Once I started doing this, I can tell you that that my that that it brought so much joy and meaning into my practice. So habit one, habit two. What I'm going to first explain what it's not, and then we're going to talk about what it is. Okay, here's what it's not. It's not find it and fix it, and that's what we all. And, and there's nothing wrong with find it and fix it. That's good. We got to do that. But here's what find it and fix it. So what brings you in today? Well, I've been having a cough. You then ask all the questions. How long have you had? Is it bloody? Is it mucus? Nighttime is it only on Mondays and Thursdays, blah, blah, blah. Then the doc does the examination, orders the appropriate test, makes a diagnosis, gets treatment. That's, that's fine, you know. Uh, we all need to do that. And um, nothing wrong with it. But let's talk about what getting patient perspective is. So it's not about asking those, you know, detailed, you know, technical questions. Here's what it is. Let's talk about version. Here's version one. So what brings you in today, Mary? Well, I've been having a cough. But now instead of this usual question, he tries this approach. So Mary, before I ask you more specifics, let me ask you, what do you think is causing the cough? Well, uh, I think it's probably allergies. The pollen's really bad this time of year. Okay, sounds possible. Let me ask you a few more questions. Quick, check it out. Okay, let's try version two. Before I ask you more specific and examine, let me ask Mary, how does this cough most affect your life? Well, the main thing is that it really gets bad when I go to Jen's soccer practice. I'm team mom, got to be there. Let's try version three. And before I ask you more specifically, examine you, Mary, while you say it's probably from allergies, is there anything else you fear this cough could be from? Well, Doc, you know, in my younger years, I was a pretty heavy smoker. I've quit, uh, my, but my uncle had lung cancer, and that was kind of in the back of my mind. Could, you, could lung cancer be passed in the genes? So what are the questions you ask? So here's three suggestions. You just heard them. What do you think is wrong? What's the main way this affects your life? And what do you fear most about these symptoms? So now the doctor says, it had, so this is what it is. So the doctor has this crucial information. And in addition to all the other stuff, he knows this, that the patient thinks it's allergy. He needs to frame the treatment in terms of getting her back to soccer practice. And he needs to reassure her that the cough is not lung cancer and not hereditary. And not hereditary. So the value of getting patient perspective. Um, let's... So... I'm going to, let me, uh, since we're kind of running short of time, um, let me, let me um, talk about, I want to just talk about, I, I, I just want to talk about clinician outcome. Because you could be, 
let's say you saw this patient and you just treated her for a cough and gave her the usual cough medicines and she's out the door and that's it. You're on to the next patient. But if you've taken the time to get her perspective about this and you, and you can reassure her that this is not cancer like her uncle had, boy, that lifts such a, even though it was in the back of her mind, this lifts such a burden from her, from her worry. And as a clinician, if you can, if you have done that, you can walk out of that room and it's not just another patient with a cough. This is someone that you gave a little bit of their life back to. They are free from worrying that this, it could be cancer. Who knows that may have kept her awake at night. That has got to be, and I got to be able to bring joy and meaning into your life when you do something like that. And of course the patient, the patient it leaves the office and if she just left the office, if you never asked that question, and she just left the office with some sort of cough or allergy medicine, and she had that question in the back of her mind, would that have been a successful visit for her? So getting patient perspective. I, I like this quote. It's an Osler quote. And here's what it comes down to. Here's what it can do. Here's the heart of getting patient perspective. It's not about what's the matter. See, we all do. What's the matter? What's the matter? I'll fix it. I'll find it. I'll fix it. It's not about what's the matter. It's about what matters. What matters to people? What mattered to this lady was making sure she that lung cancer wasn't hereditary. That's what mattered. Okay, here's here's one more thing, um, you know, and this is what I this is what I started to do. I would give my registration clerk a little form, and it would have two questions. It would say, "What's your most important concern for the doctor today?" And I think as a lot of you do that, it might that may be called your chief complaint. But then I list under that says, "List the most important questions you would like answered." And my hope is that this that maybe this person would say, I just, "Doc, I just want to make sure this is not lung cancer or something," and you could and you would know where to go. Okay. Um, have any of you seen the monkey business uh, illusion? Okay, I, I can't tell, but I'm going to show you this video of the monkey business illusion. And this is what I'm going to, whoops. Um, go back. The monkey business illusion. Let's watch this. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half miss the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. No. No. Learn more about this illusion and the original gorilla experiment at theinvisiblegorilla.com. Mm -hmm. Actually, no, actually they got it wrong. The lesson is not, is not that when you focus on the gorilla, the problem is, was when you're focused on these minuscule, the ball bouncing and catching and all that, you miss the big stuff. You miss the gorilla. That's what the problem is. And that's what the problem is. And that's when we're all focused on the find it and fix it. And is it hurt on Thursdays or Tuesdays and all of that? 
And we miss the big stuff, like reassuring someone that they that they don't have cancer, that they was in the back of their mind. We never even asked that question. That's the that's the group that, that's the monkey thing that we that we lose sight of the big stuff, the important stuff, the what's matter stuff, because we're focused on the what's the matter. So um, so this maybe I'm hoping that you'll that some of these skills that you'll think about doing this invest in the beginning, try to work on these habits, right? The, perhaps the ones you don't build rapport, the social comment, make a social comment, familiar with patient, thank the ride giver, plan the visit, you know, get the list, TKO the list, work on your homepage in your exam room, make patients want to be happy that they know you, uh, build rapport with your staff. Remember, you could all be, um, Tops in your field. On habit two, in every visit, try to ask one perspective question. You know, what do you think is causing the problem? How does this problem impact your life? And what's your biggest fear about it? So um, that's the four habits of communication where that's habit one and two. We'll see you back on May 11th for habit three, expressing empathy and habit four, closing the visit. And that's me. And when I was practicing medicine, you know, neurology, they always accuse us of not being able to cure anything, and they're probably right, but they but we have great names for things. So people would come in and they say, Doctor, you're not really doing anything for me. Uh, you know, do you have a magic wand? So I got a magic wand. And people come in and they say, Nothing works, Dr. Abramson. So I bring out the magic wand and I tap their head three times. <laughs> Patients are saying, Does this work? And I say those three magic words, you know, they does this work, doctor? I say, You never know. You never know. So anyway, we'll uh, we'll see you then in uh, on May 13th. Any questions or comments? I think we have a few minutes left. We do. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A box, the chat box, use the raise hand feature to speak directly to Dr. Abramson. I think my internet is stable, so I should be able to uh, facilitate those. I apologize yeah. for that earlier. Um, and I love magic. That is great. I'll stop sharing for you. Uh -huh. um yeah right. we'll, we'll pause for a minute and also um if you think of a question afterwards and you don't want to wait until the next session next month you can always submit any console uh through our vc platform mm -hmm. and if I, I believe uh people are sharing computers which is great we encourage that but it zoom will only pick up the person that is logged in. So if somebody is with you, they will not get the email uh, with the the um the reference sheet or the uh, see me survey. So if you could just make sure I get that name, I will make sure that you get all the information you need. So I don't think we have any questions. Okay. Thank you all, Dr. Abramson. I always enjoy our sessions. Thank you so much, and thank you all for joining us today. Okay, and take care of that headache, Kristen. Oh. And the chest pain and the allergies. Chest pain, everything else. Yeah, I hope you're feeling better. <laughs> All right, Dr. Abramson. Okay. Bye-bye.